Well, it's my pleasure to have this opportunity to uh, welcome all of you and to introduce our, our good president. If any of you had any doubts about President Holland's risk-taking bent, uh, I think that can be dispel dispelled by the fact that he continues to ask me to introduce him. Uh, and so uh, obviously he uh, is a risk taker. However, uh, he was quite uh, wise this time. Rather than giving me a week to prepare, uh, he's given me a couple of hours. And so uh, I don't have a script and I'll have to be a little bit more straight uh, forward on this. But uh, I think it would be fair to say that uh, this annual meeting is perhaps uh, certainly among the most important, if not the most important, university-wide meeting where the president has an opportunity to lay out and outline and review the budget for the upcoming year. We're very fortunate to have a president who is committed to an open and transparent and collaborative process. I've been asked from time to time, well, do we really follow through with PBA? I mean, do we really take all of those requests? Uh, are there not things that get approved sort of under the table? And uh, I can tell you that there aren't, that our PBA process is indeed an open and collaborative one, and the president and the cabinet stick to that and review it on a regular basis. Many other universities have processes that are more shrouded in mystery and intrigue, and that's certainly not the case. And when people come to UVU as evaluators or visitors, they're always impressed by our budgeting process. I can't think of, a, of another individual than President Holland who I would rather have at the helm of UVU. He has the interests of the institution, he has the sensitivity to things throughout the institution, has a vision for where we are going, has the compassion and desire to consider and reflect upon all parties and uh, 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 objectives. It's not an easy task. We're very pleased to have uh, President Matthew Holland as our president, so please join me in welcoming him this morning. Well, Ian, with an introduction like that, you're ruining my reputation as a risk taker. So uh, Ian's a terrific man. It's a great honor to work with him and to have gotten to know him better. Uh, there is something uh, that I discover about Ian that uh, he keeps a little plaque on his credenza in his office. I think really highlights the essence of his character. Just a little phrase that says, all I want is a warm bed, a kind word, and unlimited power. <laughs> and that, that's kind of Ian in a nutshell, I think, for those of you who know him. So uh, uh, it's, uh, it used to be cliché to say this, but I'm not sure it is anymore. Uh, but he is the true essence of a gentleman and a scholar. It's a, it's a treat to work with him. Well, um, it's, uh, it's great to be with you today. Uh, the, the air is clear. The sun is bright. Uh, I see a good omen in that for us as an institution today. Uh, having come through, admittedly, uh, not the easiest year and not the easiest winter. And so we do need to talk about uh, that and some of the realities that we face. We do face some realities, and there's some images that have come to mind for me, especially as we've gone into this event. I think we came into this event uh, both you know, from a culinary perspective and a budgetary perspective, hoping for a feast of something like this in proportions for Hoagies with Holland. And what we'll be delivering <laughs> may look a little more like this. I'm sorry that's where we are. Um, but uh, I think uh, there is great hope, great optimism in, in what, we're, what we are actually able to do, I think it's been pretty remarkable. And, um, and I think what's even more remarkable is, is where we're headed still as an institution. So it's in that spirit. We just want to talk uh, very openly, candidly, about what we're facing, 
what we've gone through, the assumptions we've made about uh, doing what we've got with what we have, and then where we're headed into the future. So I think it's always important in these moments to take at least a few minutes and celebrate what we have accomplished as an institution. And uh, I, I always love doing this, but it's also, uh, I always worry about doing this because I cannot possibly talk about everything that happens on this campus uh, and, and what we've done as, as an institution. All I can do is talk about a few representative things, some emblematic things of the, the fantastic accomplishments of the people who are here. And as always, I like to start with our, uh, with our students. Uh, our students are why we're here. They're a reason for being. And so I always want us to keep an eye on what they're doing. Their success is really the ultimate measure of our success. And so we've had some tremendous successes this year. Uh, if you uh, consider what uh, our folks in the theater department with their award from the Kennedy Center, uh, this is uh, truly uh, uh, the way Christopher Clark explains it. I think it's very apt. This is like winning the NCAA tournament for theater. Uh, it, it's, it's really hard to overestimate just how significant award this is for uh, our theater department with that national award. Other national awards with our students in poetry, our students help break the ground for this building that they're paying for that's going to be such a wonderful addition to us. Uh, we're volunteering uh, many, many thousands of hours. Uh, we've been uh, cited uh, with an honor of distinction from a presidential commission on civic engagement uh, for what we've done, uh, uh, distinguishing ourselves uh, within our region and across the nation. Uh, Dozens and dozens of uh, student-participated uh, research projects presented at NCUR and UCUR. Uh, uh, over 200 presentations across uh, students all across the campus. Uh, we've designed uh, mobile apps uh, for uh, different companies and organizations. Won top awards at the International Media Arts. Uh, won the statewide uh, PR competition. Participated in a global commerce uh, exchange. Uh, very excited about the student-led production of Cato, part of the uh, presidential reading uh, this year. Uh, national regional awards in construction management and uh, same for marketing competitions. Participated in over 2,300 internships, including some very prominent ones at the United Nations. Uh, we presented at the United Nations Conference on Sustainability, 19 medals at Skills USA. Uh, two individual titles at the, at the rodeo and best of state honors for our uh, fire and rescue academy. And so, um, how about a round of applause for our fantastic students? And again, those students couldn't do what they do without you, without faculty, without mentors, without staff, and without everyone who makes uh, this institution uh, run. Let's uh, talk now about some uh, broader highlights uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, faculty and staff and things that we've accomplished institutionally. Uh, we're very proud of this experiment that we did this year, launching a freshman convocation. 3,000 people filling the uh, UCCU Center, uh, these freshmen talking about what a great university experience this was and how excited it left them about their, the thing that they were heading, uh, heading off to do. Cut the ribbon on our Constitutional Studies Center with a uh, prominent Pulitzer uh, Prize winner like uh, David McCullough coming to help us kick that off. Uh, designated uh, after just a couple of short years as a top 10 program in the financial planning field. And uh, uh, Professor Jay Desart's uh, uh, forecast for the election was as accurate as any in the nation, got national attention for what we're doing there. Celebrated the wonderful accomplishments of Susan Thackeray, uh, who was awarded the Excellence in uh, Education Award from the Women's Technology Council. What a great statewide recognition for her. Tim Doyle's work on uh, cancer research, uh, attracting, again, uh, regional and national attention, working with students at Huntsman Cancer and now in American Fork Hospital. Uh, receiving more funding, uh, over half a million dollars in NSF grants. I welcome 1,600 Latino students uh, as part of our Latinos in Action Conference. Celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Center for the Study of Ethics. 
got a wonderful invitation to join the WAC, a whole new era for us uh, on the athletic front. Uh, hired a wonderful new dean for the School of Education, $3 million cybersecurity grant. Uh, created effectively our new college, College of Aviation and Public Services, and uh, had that uh, transfer of power that's off and running. Uh, we've broken the ground for a new uh, We Care facility that will dramatically expand the uh, options for students and also provide some expanded opportunities for faculty and staff for safe, flexible on-site daycare. That comes thanks in large part to a, a contribution from Barbara Barrington Jones, $2 million. Um, I have to give a little shout out, shamelessly so, for my wife Paige. Part of Barbara's our, our contribution came in large part from a, uh, a luncheon that Paige uh, helped to host where we, where we were able to come and talk about uh, the needs of our We Care Center. Paige has also contributed, continued to contribute on campus under this heading of what we can do to help more young women come and complete their college degree here, helping working with the um, uh, Center for Women's Success on uh, hosting a ladies' night that was very well attended. And uh, we've ha hosted just a range of uh, great figures. Uh, uh, this is Sir Ken Robinson, who came and gave a great presidential lecture on creativity and innovation. But uh, whether it's fantasy literature, religious liberty, global ethical issues, um, literacy, uh, autism, we have bought, brought the best and brightest onto this campus to talk to, uh, have them talk to us, have them talk to our students, talk to the community. It's been very, a very successful set of uh, uh, talks, I think. I want to take a minute uh, to do something I, m I might ordinarily do uh, maybe in uh, uh, faculty and, and later staff convocations where I talk about my presidential initiatives and what we've done. But I do think one of the things I, I want to bring forward in this setting is to talk about what we have accomplished with respect to promoting campus safety and emergency preparedness. You know this has been a priority for a couple of years now. The first year we didn't make, I didn't think, nearly enough progress. This year we really have. And I, I really give uh, credit to, uh, uh, to Val Peterson, Robin Ebermeyer, and the, and the council, President's Council, for pushing and promoting this. We've had a very aggressive uh, training to prepare for something we hope never happens, an active shooter situation on campus, but training for the senior administration and then departmental training. I think we've done that in every department but 20. Uh, I have not yet had the report of what the 20 are, but it may be coming if you don't get to it, so please do so quickly. Um, Improved radio communications, new radios for all of our building captains, a new tower that enhances our ability to uh, increase coverage o over most of campus, which we haven't had before. Uh, significant improvements in electronic communication with our electronic uh, billboards, uh, iNotify to give uh, pop-up messages, uh, updated text messaging system. Uh, we still have some work to do. I got the reports on the great shakeout texts uh, that some delivered not right promptly, uh, but we're working on that. We know we need to do it. We're better than we were, and we'll continue to get, uh, we'll continue to get better. Um, so uh, in all of these things, we, we try regularly, as we did with the active shooter drill and with the great shakeout, to do this in conjunction with our state public officials and uh, other emergency coordinators. And so we've heightened our uh, alignment with them. And this summer, we will be putting in a new public broadcast system that in, a, in the event of a, uh, of a broad spread emergency, we can get out quickly word to everywhere over a loudspeaker system. Thank you all for participating in the great Utah Shakeout. We had very high rates of participation, good feedback about things we're doing well, other areas that we need to work on. Uh, this is, uh, again, we're trying to lead by example in the cabinet. Uh, this was my quick move as the alarm came forward. Just so you know that, you know, hail, sleet, nor snow will stop uh, the presidential suite from working. This is Kyle right next to me. Uh, we worked right through it. I hope you were equally productive. Uh, uh, but uh, all, all kidding aside, I, I just want you to know, this is one of the things that just I worry about the most, is just the basic safety of this campus, and are we doing enough? And we can't do this unless we work on it together. And so these, these drills, they matter, and, and these procedures that we do and the training that we do, it never comes at a convenient time, 
but we have to do it because we'll save lives. Uh, it would just the world is a, a dangerous place, and uh, we're we're going to be no more immune to these things than other institutions. So. We need to be prepared even as we hope nothing ever happens. We hope we never have to put any of this into place, but if, if it does happen, we need to be ready. And so I appreciate your, your support in pushing this forward. So uh, the uh, other thing uh, that I think we really uh, need to celebrate is the great accomplishment of structured enrollment. Uh, again, it will be sort of years before we know the full impact of this, but this, is, this has had impacts all across campus, faculty and staff, uh, counselors and advisors, people working together to kind of change a whole culture and way of, of bringing students into the system and in a way that really works hard to still make this as an accommodating and welcoming place for all students, whatever their level of preparation, while getting students better prepared and better channeled into for success. For those of you that came to State of the University, you've seen these stats before, but again, it's, I think, worth repeating the, the, what a signal they are for the early optimism we have for the impact that this will have. But this is our typical trend uh, under our open admissions enrollment policy that we start with a third week count that's much higher than our end of term count. We lose a lot of students by the end of term. And so the question is, well, what's, what's going to happen now with structured enrollment? So this year, here was our third week count. Now, again, the, the drop, if you compare third week to third week, you might say, well, maybe structured enrollment wasn't such a good idea. Did it send too many students away? And we probably did lose some students. We need to work harder, especially to go capture those, some of those non-traditional students that may have felt a little weeded out, which was not our intention. But that actually wasn't the biggest source of the drop. We do have students uh, who left because of the economy, uh, because the economy is picking up, and I'll say more about that in just a minute. And we also had a significant reduction in concurrent enrollment. And so that explains the big drop. Uh, now, the good news in all this is that here's what happened by the end of term. And what this says to us, and again, it will take years to verify, but, uh, but the, the early indication seems to be that with this new process, while we still have these big, broad, open doors for everybody who applies, they're, you're admitted, uh, they're coming in and they're better directed, they're better prepared, and they're staying. We basically held on to every student who came in at the first of the semester, and we picked up a few more at the second block. And uh, I, I, I just have to take a moment and, and say a, a real set of thanks uh, to our advisors, our enrollment services folks and student affairs, uh, uh, the uh, academic affairs who work closely in terms of promoting this and encouraging this. A lot of effort went into this. It wasn't easy to do, but I think the payoff for the students, for the efficiency, for starting us on a more serious note as we begin the year is worthy of a great single round of applause. So. Okay, um, so uh, just before I get into what I know you're all uh, really interested in, which is the budget and kind of where, where we've landed, where we're headed, I do want to take uh, this moment of a captive audience to highlight a few upcoming events that we'd love to see terrific uh, turnout for. So um, the first one is uh, another presidential lecture series. Generally, we just do one presidential uh, lecture a semester and we had a, we had a great one um, uh, earlier, uh, just a few days ago, with Jim McGregor, who came and spoke about doing business with China as part of that conference. It was very interesting. Uh, but uh, when uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Potashny was mentioned to me that he was going to be on campus, I thought there's no way we can have him here and not have him do a presidential lecture. This is a true Renaissance man, and uh, he'll be talking about the musings on music and science, and he's a molecular biologist uh, who is of true international stature and fame for some of the breakthroughs uh, he's, uh, he's made in that field and is uh, virtually an equally talented violinist, and we'll be talking about this. So this should be a feast uh, for, uh, in the sciences and in the arts, and encourage you to uh, make note and try to attend that on Friday night. We'd love to have a wonderful turnout for that, and it promises to be a very rewarding evening. 
Uh, I did want to uh, give you uh, the preview about uh, the freshman reading challenge that I'm doing for this year. Uh, two, uh, as is my habit, there are t two works that I'm challenging the students to read. The first one is actually kind of a, a little collection. It's the Apology of uh, Socrates and the Crito. These are two relatively short um, dialogues, if you will, and it's about Socrates' trial in Athens. Uh, that's actually a lot more interesting than it may sound to you. Uh, uh, this is really the beginning, in many respects, of the Western intellectual tradition. There are important issues about uh, intellectual integrity and academic freedom and moral education and training the youth and politics and society and education. It's all wrapped up there in a very interesting way. It's not that long a reading, but it's very kind of classical texts on these issues. and so. We'll be, uh, we'll be reading that, and our theater department will be putting together a unique uh, kind of rendition uh, performance uh, of these dialogues in the fall. The other reading is My Dream of Stars and, um, uh, by Anushe Ansari, and a, a terrific story about uh, this woman, an Iranian, the first to go up into space, and she's both an engineer and an entrepreneur of uh, remarkable accomplishment. And uh, what's exciting to me about this is that uh, she will be our graduation speaker this year. So we'll get a wonderful preview at graduation about the book that we'll be asking our freshmen to read uh, in, in the coming year. Uh, as a way to say thanks, uh, we'll be hosting our spring employee appreciation night, April 30th, 6 p.m. UVU will be playing a school just somewhere over there, the, the name we do not speak here. Uh, so uh, please come, cheer, uh, we'd, uh, we, we look forward to that. And uh, again, free, free admission on the tickets and uh, up to five free food vouchers. It should be, uh, should be a good night. And then finally, uh, UV Self. Uh, I just couldn't be more enthused with how this program is developing. I think it gets better every year. We've instituted now a, a formal 360 degree evaluation of leadership traits. We've worked out some core competencies on leadership. We've been working with a, uh, one of the, the wor truly world's leading consultant agencies on, on leadership development in conjunction with our own thinking about what's needed at UVU. I think if you talk to the participants that come from the faculty side and the staff side, you'll hear that they've, they've had a really terrific experience. So if you'd like, if, if that's, you see that in your future and your career path planning, uh, wh wherever you are, please apply and, uh, and, and consider participating in this uh, with us. Uh, actually, this is finally, finally. Uh, Summer University is uh, coming up. The theme this year is Building Bridges. Uh, Mark uh, Townsend, uh, excuse me, Matt Townsend will be, uh, will be the speaker. And uh, got a great uh, uh, night planned, uh, activity night with Wreck-It Ralph and the usual set of uh, uh, seminars and courses that people can participate in and service activity. So I hope you'll uh, take, uh, take note of all of that. Okay, well, with, uh, with that done, uh, let me move now into the main event and talk about um, where we are uh, with respect to the budget and uh, where we see ourselves uh, moving forward. As kind of to set the stage for this, we need to keep something in mind. We have become a very tuition-dependent institution. Now, there are reasons for that. It has to do with our open enrollment mission. It has to do with the economy, and, and it has to do with the demographics of this valley. It's a very, you know, there are a lot of variables here. But however we got here, this, this is where we are, is that the bulk of our budget comes from tuition now. What that means is that we're obviously, from a budgetary uh, perspective, very sensitive to changes in enrollment. And we are facing some enrollment challenges right now. So in 2011, we hit kind of a peak. And that was uh, good in the sense that it was bringing in those students and that revenue. And we were growing and hiring and expanding. And it was all uh, very exciting. Uh, the challenge is that this year we started to go down, and there are a number of reasons for that. You can see where we're down in 2012 and what our projection is for 2013. So um, this is worth taking a minute. This is going to get a little bit technical, but I just want uh, we all need to know what we're going through and what we're wrestling with uh, 
week by week, uh, month by month, as we consider some of these issues. So uh, the first uh, part here is uh, the, the first thing affecting trends is not the LDS mission change. I'll get to that in a minute. That's a big issue. But it's, it's actually not the, the first thing. Even before the LDS mission change, uh, age change, we were facing a decline in enrollment, um, close to a 3% decline in enrollment in the fall that was primarily due to probably some of the changes we made with structured enrollment, but, but the bigger share of that being changes due to the economy. That the, all, the signals are, the, uh, from the informal input of the business leaders to various data that's available from our state uh, economic uh, observers, is that the economy is picking up, students are, are going back into the workforce. We have some data on that. Uh, at, in, just in terms of the fall to, to spring uh, rate, we had 23% uh, of fall non-returning non students indicated that they, they left school because of work opportunities. The graph at the bottom shows you the kind of uh, counter-cyclical operation that works when the economy is up, enrollment tends to go down. When the economy tends to go down, enrollment tends to go up. And so we're in one of those, you know, kind of loops right now where the economy, which has been uh, stalled for so, so long, now seems to be picking up in the state at a decent pace, and that's providing more opportunities for our students. They're going, they're going back to work. So um, now let me talk about the missionary um, uh, issue because on top of the economic uh, issue, uh, we've got uh, the announcement of the LDS Church in October that uh, LDS young men could serve a mission at 18 and LDS young women could serve a mission at 19 if they uh, so desired. So what, what do we know, what can we say about this? Roughly 80% of our students uh, self-identify as, um, uh, as uh, belonging to, to uh, the LDS Church. And so this is, uh, so an announcement like this is undoubtedly going to have a very large impact uh, on us. We also know that according to historical patterns, that roughly 53% uh, on average of 18-year-old, uh, uh, of the 18-year-old uh, young men who enter UVU will eventually serve an LDS mission. 14% of uh, 18 to 19 year old females entering UVU will eventually serve uh, an LDS mission. That's the historical data. So what I'm just gonna take you through now is a very simplified version of the assumptions that we are making for budget projections. We feel we have to do this. It would be irresponsible not to do this. So um, as we look uh, to uh, fall 2013, and the estimates that we're facing, we figure 50% uh, of, um, of the 18-year-olds entering, uh, or who would have entered otherwise, will now not enter and go on missions. Now that's down a little bit from the 53, in part because we're seeing our numbers drop a little bit in terms of those who self-identify as LDS, so we think that's a, a fairly reasonable and safe assumption. It's close to the average, down a little bit given what we see happening with the larger population. On the other hand, with the young women, uh, we're seeing already a dramatic change in student patterns and enrollment behaviors. Uh, and data that has been provided to us by the LDS Church that suggests that uh, LDS uh, particip participation of young women in that age group uh, is, is climbing anywhere from three to four times its, its uh, historic levels. And so we have made an assumption of that climbing from 14 to 40 percent. Now, do we know exactly that's how it's going to play out? No. We're making the best assumption we can. And again, I've given you a simplified version. There have, there have been, you know, reams of analysis done on this uh, with data from the, st from the commissioner's office, from the LDS church, from our own data. We've done it for fall. We've done it for spring. We're trying to consider all the assumptions that we think should be brought to bear on this. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're, we're making our best educated guess as to where this will go. Uh, could it go higher? Could more go on missions and therefore lower our, uh, our tuition? Yes. Uh, could other things happen that would mitigate against that? We're going to try to do that. But we think this is a, a moderate uh, assumption about, uh, uh, moderate meaning not extreme either direction, 
about what we see happening with enrollments in the fall. And if you look at uh, what's happening already, you can, you, can see, you can see the trends. We had a big dip last summer. That was another issue, independent of these other things, of the economy and uh, whatnot. This was basically due to the Pell Grant change. We hope we don't experience anything like that again uh, with that uh, out of the way. Uh, but then we had you know, nearly the 3% drop uh, in the fall and then a 5% drop in the spring. So that already shows you that in the spring, we were already facing the effects of this, uh, of this missionary change because uh, usually we don't drop that much in the spring. If we we're going to have a bigger drop, it would be in the fall. So what we're projecting is a, a little over a 4% drop in the summer, a 6.5% drop in the fall, and then a 4 just a little bit over a 4% drop in the spring. And so uh, this is where we see ourselves headed, and that does affect, uh, does affect the budget picture pretty significantly. So let's, uh, let's talk about that. Um, already in spring, uh, we have effectively lost $4 million in revenue uh, because of the, the combination of the factors that I've just described. What we're projecting is that uh, we would lose another $4 million on top of that uh, with our projections for the fall for a total of a $9 million deficit. So what are we doing about this? Well, the first thing is uh, I, I'm happy to say, and I've, I've said this before, that due to what I think is the careful stewardship and management of our financial resources of preparing for the unexpected, not you know, spending our budget so close to the margin that we don't have any wiggle room, that we went through this semester with very little disruption to anything that we were doing, despite losing $4 million effectively in the middle of the year. So thanks uh, to uh, those contingencies that we had on hand, and also thanks to the hiring chill. And I know this was a real challenge uh, for a number of departments, uh, that were anxious to hire and fill positions, uh, but it was part of the vacancy savings that were created from that and that will also spill into something I'll say a little bit later about how uh, reducing the number of reductions we had to do this year. That was a huge help to us to make us, to help us get through this, uh, this effectively semester without any more dramatic, radical uh, steps to be taken. So. What are we uh, doing uh, for 2013-14? Uh, uh, Two things. Uh, we have been working hard and are going to continue to work hard at securing new and additional revenues. Uh, but we cannot close the gap entirely with new revenues. There did have to be some budget reductions, and that's what we've been working on for a few weeks and what I will be uh, now uh, talking about. So let me take those in, in, in both those steps. First, what's the picture on new revenue? And second, what's the picture on, on budget reductions? So um, uh, new ongoing funds. Uh, I think we had uh, a, quite a good year at the legislative uh, session. I'll, I'll speak, I'll say a little bit more about that in detail. Uh, but we, uh, we got uh, over $5 million in new ongoing tax funds. And then uh, there was a system-wide raising of first-tier tuition that brought in $4.5 million. And then, again, just because of what we're facing with our, with our cuts and other, uh, other needs that we have moving forward, we were one of two schools to raise second-tier tuition, feeling like we had to do everything possible to both plug the gap and to move the institution forward. So that brings us to a total of roughly $10 million of new funds. Now, the quick reaction might be to say, well, OK, you said roughly $9 million budget hole, $10 million in new funds, that solves the problem. But it's not quite that simple. So we need to talk about that. Of the new monies, uh, a number of them were designated, legislatively designated, for specific projects. So we didn't, we didn't have any, they couldn't go fill that gap. They were for new things or uh, things that we had to pay that weren't part of uh, the previous budget. Uh, so uh, some uh, rising costs on the benefits side, we got some legislative money for that. 
We got some money for an engineering initiative, and so we had to plug that into positions. And we've got some money for mission-based initiatives. And I'll go through in just a minute what, what each of those are. But just generically saying, there was at least $3 million of that $10 million that was legislatively directed about how we needed to spend it. We also have other critical needs. Even as we're facing uh, budget cuts, there are things that we just feel we had to do. Even if we were going to cut in other areas, there were other areas not only could we not cut, but we had to invest in. And the number one concern for me and the, and the cabinet and the council, uh, and I'm hoping, thinking for you, is compensation. And so uh, we made a decision that even in this very tough time that you all have been working so hard and so long without any adjustment or with basically the 1% COLA from last year that we had to do something. We couldn't not do anything. Uh, we know that your costs are climbing, uh, whether it's health care or just day-to-day -day expenses, and so uh, we felt that we had to do something. So uh, there was uh, some encouragement from the legislature to do a 1% COLA, uh, even though they didn't give us exactly give us the money for that. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, so we felt we had to find a way to do that. And we also have obligations on rank and tenure. Those are commitments we make as an institution, as part of an academic community. We have to do that. We also see that there were, some, there were developing some very serious equity issues, that some of you and your positions are getting really out of whack with what the market trends are and what other opportunities are. We've had to fill some holes with that. And we had to do our part to close the gap, at least more of the gap, on medical and dental. So uh, did we have to do that? No. Did we do it? Yes, because we felt it was imperative. We felt that you need it, that we need to move forward, that we need to keep and attract the best talent that we can. We need to keep you as whole as possible and help you move forward as you can. And so uh, we've made a commitment on that. And I'll explain the details of that again in just a And then there are just a few essential uh, PBA requests. Uh, even though we have fewer students, there are some things about our infrastructure that don't change and their, their costs increase that we just are obligated to, to do. There's a, just a handful, just not very many, but a few key faculty and staff positions that we have to do for a variety of reasons. And then we have made investments in student recruitment and retention because that's part of the way we get out of this, is if we can attract more students and hold on to them, then we can, uh, we can help uh, soften this uh, as we move forward. So we're taking a bit of a risk there, investing in some money now that we think will, return, will create a return on investment uh, more, than, uh, more than what we paid. So uh, once you get through uh, uh, that, that, uh, you know, uh, that we, we still, having done that, we still tried to save some money to fill that hole. Uh, so there's a balancing act here. Do as much as we could possibly do on the compensation front. Do the absolute essential things we had to do on infrastructure and personnel, and then put the rest into the budget hole so that we would minimize the reductions we would have to make across the board. So. Let me try to paint this picture now about where, where everything's going. Back to the budget shortfall, $9.3 million shortfall. So the first thing we do is plug it with the new monies that we got, again, from, I think, a, an effective uh, legislative session uh, that allowed to give us some flexibility and some tuition monies. And so that, that, takes, a, that takes a bite out of it. Uh, the other thing uh, that we're doing, again, is we're making investments to go out and get uh, uh, students we wouldn't have had before. So real push, and we got some help from the legislature on a public policy shift to go out and do some non-resident uh, recruiting. 
And we haven't, we haven't done much of this before. I mean, we have a fair amount of, uh, we have a number of non-residents, but it's never been a big push because we've never worried that much about students. But we're going to make a push this year, and we've got some recruiters. They're out there as we speak. And uh, we've got some deals uh, structured around, uh, around the world, really, to try to uh, make $630,000. So that would be net, okay? So whatever our investments were in these positions, we would recoup that plus, you know, over a half million dollars of new revenue uh, on new resident. Maybe we can do more. Uh, hard to say. This is the first year we're really doing that. Maybe next year we can do even more than that, but we're, we're moving aggressively on that. So that should take care of a little bit of the, uh, of the piece of the pie. Then the next place we look is centrally. What can we, before we go out to you and your departments and your programs and your offices and ask you where the cuts can be, are there kind of central cost savings that we could identify that would uh, lessen the impact of these cuts? And we did identify some of these. We found some cost savings in our hourly uh, benefits, primarily our student workers. It doesn't change their benefits, but by the way, we've shifted over to some student workers. There was some, we've, we discovered some cost savings there. Uh, shifting some things to overhead, uh, 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 reimbursed overhead uh, accounts. We're going to narrow our revenue contingency, and there, there's some trade-offs with that, but we have a little bit of cushion because we have been preparing for the rainy day, and so we can, this is, it's raining, so uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take uh, some monies out of that. And then with our dropping in enrollments in, uh, in summer, we found some, uh, some savings there. So uh, what, the, what that left uh, remaining was the budget cuts for the divisions and the reduction, reductions across uh, uh, the divisions. And so let me uh, say a word about that. This is a hard thing. I just, there's no other way to say it. Uh, no one wanted to do this. But if we're going to maintain our quality, if we're going to ensure that we make progress on um, what's still just relatively a modest compensation uh, bump, but something I think absolutely needed, and function the way we need to function, we, we really had uh, no other choice. And uh, I have to give great credit to all of you uh, who came together to figure out how to do this, minimizing the impact on, on individual people and maximizing the quality of, the, uh, of our product and our delivery. So uh, there is a principle at work here, kind of budgeting principle that's worth noting, which is to say uh, that you know, what we can do in various places across campus does become contingent on students. If our students are up, uh, then uh, our tuition revenues are up, our operating budget's up, and we, we can uh, demand for sections and services up, and we can channel those monies into, those, into that demand and accommodate. And that's what we've been doing for so many years. But the inverse is also true. When students are down, tuition's down, operating budget's down, but so is demand for those services. And so one of the natural uh, consequences of that, we have to reduce some of those services and programs. Now, one of the challenges of that, sometimes that happens unevenly. And so uh, this is not a time to say everybody's just going to be treated equally. Some of those programs that have had less demand, we've had to cut back more in those areas. Uh, and when the demand comes back, we'll, uh, we'll put more resources back into those things. So that's a principle we've had in mind as we've moved forward. So what is the impact of these reductions? Well, obviously, as I've just said, fewer sections and services, but as much as possible and aligned with the change in student demand. Uh, we will have less operating funds in the coming year, so less money for, uh, for current expense, travel, equipment. It's just going to be a little tighter in some of those areas and, and basically uh, all across campus. Less central flexibility. Again, it's raining. We've had to use some of those rainy day funds. If more rain and more flood comes, well, we'll have to face that when we face it. But I think it now is the time to be using that. We're hopeful that uh, that will be sufficient to, uh, to carry us through uh, the coming year. Does mean we'll have fewer employees. And this is one of the most painful things about this. But again, I, I give great credit to the institution for how we work together to make this work. So um, uh, thank you again for being willing to do the hiring chill. As a result of the hiring chill, what, most of the positions that were lost were lost 
to what were held open vacant positions instead of having to go fire somebody. And so we had, by the, uh, by the time we got all the numbers worked out and had gone, worked out the issues, there were four vacant tenure uh, faculty lines and eight vacant staff lines that were held through the chill that we were able just to say, okay, we're not letting anyone go, we're just not gonna fill those. And there's quite a bit of savings in there. Uh, there are five lecturers. Uh, these are folks who are on yearly contracts that we're not able to hire again. And so, and this is for the whole institution. Uh, and so when you think about what our budget deficit was, um, and that there are, there are just very few folks uh, who have been affected by this, I really give great credit to the planning, the coordination, the communication, the discipline that the whole institution demonstrated to preserve basically uh, uh, everyone's position except for a, a handful of uh, lecture positions. There will be some adjustment in the hourly staff and, 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 and faculty moving forward, but that'll have to get worked out on an ongoing as needed basis, which is how hourly uh, uh, operations work on this campus. So some things to keep in mind. Again, as I've tried to st stress, this was not just me and the cabinet deciding this in a vacuum. All sorts of input from division and uh, departmental leaders all throughout the system about where we make these cuts. The cuts have been identified. Parties have been informed, so if you haven't been informed, you can rest easy here. Uh, and as I, again, I said, there, there are only a, a handful anyway. The hiring chill is lifted. We're moving forward with uh, this, one of the reasons that we make the assumptions we're making. We want to operate with business as normal. We don't want you going into the next year feeling like, you know, oh, we still don't know what's happening. Can we do this? Can we not do that? We've, we've kind of taken the, the big bite right now, and now we're saying move forward. And so the hiring chill is lifted, and we are moving forward. And that's what I'm excited about, is while this is sort of hard to talk about and something we've had to do, uh, the signals about where we are and what we're able to achieve moving forward, I think, remain as exciting and optimistic and dynamic as they've ever been. And so let's talk for a minute now about um, uh, these PBA allocation decisions. Um, so um, we will uh, first talk about compensation. So uh, on, the, on the faculty side, again, uh, well, 1% uh, COLA uh, for faculty for everybody, but we're starting with the faculty here. Uh, in addition to that, um, we have 0.3% uh, will be d devoted so that we can do uh, rank and tenure advancements. And then another 1% in targeted equity and retention to go address those particular positions that are most um, out of sync with uh, market benchmarks. So overall, uh, not individually, but overall to the faculty, it, it equates to a 2.3% uh, bump in compensation. On the staff side, we have just made the decision to take the 1% COLA and move it to a 2% COLA. Uh, we do that after poring over the data and looking at the concerns that have been raised by people to see that uh, we were just, the, the staff salaries were more out of sync with market rates than faculty salaries were in general. And so we felt we had to do more across the board. And so that's the 2% COLA for all staff, plus an additional 0.8 to go take care of additional uh, uh, equity issues, and then a, a another 0.3 for retention issues for our, our staff who are increasingly getting offers to go elsewhere. We need to have resources on hand to try to keep uh, uh, our, our, our best uh, staff here. That translates into, a, uh, again, overall, not individually, an overall 3.1 bump to compensation on the staff side. On the executives, 1% COLA and um, equity, targeted retention, another 0.7%, uh, uh, so a 1.7% for uh, executives overall, We're trying to again signal that if we can get monies, we want to push them first and foremost into the pockets of our faculty and staff. If there are things left over, then they can be distributed for the executives. Um, Adjuncts. Um, we're making a, another substantial shift here, 4.6 for adjuncts. This is part of a multi-year effort to get them up to uh, a closer to market rate. They have really been uh, out of sync, and we can't get them there in all one year, but this is our just continuing commitment to move on that year by year. 
our part-time staff and students, the 1% COLA. And then there was a, a request, a joint request from Pace and Faculty Senate for a $12,000 bump to the staff development fund to give uh, more opportunities for more staff to go pursue master's degrees uh, uh, here at UVU. So there's a little more opportunity for those on the staff side who want to try to do that. So um, on the benefits side, I don't want to get too into the details too much here except to say that the legislature gave us some, uh, a little bit, or gave us 9% towards our 15% increase in costs. On the UVU employer side, we've uh, rounded that out by uh, another 6%. That allows us to maintain the 90-10 premium split. We funded the dental uh, premium increase on the employer side, and the legislature took care of uh, the state retirement increase. So total new funds devoted to compensation, $6 million. And that, again, is even in a tough time with everything else that we've been facing, a signal of what we thought we need to do to start to make progress on this really critical issue for all of you. Um, engineering initiative. Uh, this was uh, the legislatively uh, 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 designated funding. So um, $400,000 to give us some scholarships and some faculty positions. Um, on the mission-based initiatives, again, this came from uh, the legislature, legislatively appointed, $180,000 uh, for a mandatory orientation program, uh, help with our recruiting efforts, uh, some completion uh, programs. Uh, we're going to start giving more two-year degrees to students. They've earned it. They ought to have that. Helps with our 66% goal. Uh, we're trying to get some more aid into the, into the summer uh, session and some help on the economic development front. And so uh, once again, uh, we're, we're happy to get those monies from the legislature. We didn't have any flexibility to do other things with them, so we're going to work and put those into uh, effect. Student recruitment and, uh, and retention. Um, we've, again, dramatically expanding our, our recruitment here, our deferred admissions program. You've seen our publicity about that. Reaching out to non-traditional students, out-of-state students. Uh, and, and by the way, let me add something here. At the back, we're going to have ambassador packets for all of you. I, I want to enlist every one of you in this effort to recruit and retain students. Uh, it, will, it will help us. Uh, it will help the students. First and foremost, they should be here anyway. But if we can get them and keep them, it will help with these budget challenges. And so these packets have been prepared to uh, go out and let you be recruiters. And if you've got you know, people in your neighborhood, uh, whether they're young or old or in between, who can be convinced to come back to school. If every one of you did that, it would make a significant help to us in the situation that we're facing right now. Uh, we've got some uh, broader marketing uh, efforts to enhance that overall recruiting effort and some key student retention initiatives. So we've put about uh, $300,000 uh, in that, believing that that will pay for itself and that the return will come back to us with new students from areas where we typically haven't had, uh, haven't had those students. Uh, now, uh, beyond that, uh, there are just a, a handful of uh, some key uh, faculty and staff positions of new appropriated funds. Uh, like I say, there's just really three on the faculty side. There's an autism position, a graphic design professional sales. Each of these are tied to some larger uh, kind of circumstance. They're either tied to some key uh, donor arrangement or uh, an unusual uh, push in growth in a particular area or an obligation the university had incurred. And these are areas that we need to see move forward in any case. So we have, uh, we have invested in a few areas there. We've got a vital need in our newly created uh, College uh, of Aviation Public Services for uh, an assistant dean of finance and a, and a university-wide programmer. So this is out of the multitude of requests that were made. We boiled it down to kind of these key uh, things. Now, there are some additional hires we'll make on the non-appropriated side, so I'm trying to be very careful here. And by the way, these, the, these slides will be available to you if you want to look at them in more detail. But uh, on the non-appropriated side, meaning there's soft monies, uh, institution, you know, revenue generating opportunities here. So English as a second language will be allowed to hire another faculty member with the revenues they're generating. And uh, Aviation Sciences has uh, some soft monies that they want to put into those three positions, and those have all been approved. 
Uh, infrastructure. Again, back to uh, a new appropriated things that we have to do. We don't have a lot of choice over PCI compliance. We traffic in a lot of personal information. It has to be protected. There are some increasing costs there we're obligated to, and increasing costs on software licenses and other uh, database uh, needs that uh, we'll put into the tune of uh, $400,000 overall. Uh, and then new, again, stress here, non-appropriated uh, base funds. So again, you may see us doing some of these things. You may say, how are we doing that in the age of these budget cuts? But these are things that are tied to internal funds that are generated for specific use that aren't fungible. So we've got some needs. We need a new stoplight on College Drive. The Canyon Park Culinary Building uh, needs a new boiler, uh, dining services, kitchens, uh, long overdue for a kitchen remodel. All of that's coming from plant funds, not these new monies that we're talking about. Student Life and Wellness Building has some O&M needs and uh, programming. That will come out of uh, uh, student fees and, and related revenue there. We Care Center, uh, other revenue, basically the, the, the payments that will be made by those who use the we care services will be will, will fund the O&M for that that's all uh, is approved and then athletics uh, I know there's been there was some issue about in the hiring freeze how did we hire a soccer coach uh, again it, it was not a hiring freeze it was a chill we continue to hire people across uh, many different uh, departments but this is an issue where the money is coming from a conference affiliation fund that the students instituted years ago these are the conference affiliation costs Starting a soccer program was the cost of entry into the WAC. So there are also some facilities upgrades that were required and some scholarship enhancement. And so those, uh, those, have, all, uh, those have all been approved. So just in summary, uh, again, uh, in terms of our new base funds allocation, the big push is on compensation. Again, I wish we could do more. Uh, but I think we've done as much as we can possibly do, balancing that against filling uh, these, uh, addressing these other cuts and, and uh, deficiencies that we've paid. Almost over 70% of these new funds then devoted one way or another to compensation, salary, retention, benefits, et cetera. Engineering initiative, mission-based uh, funding, uh, the various uh, key things from the PBA for a total of uh, a little over $8 million. And so uh, that's, uh, that that balances it out. Uh, by doing all of those things, we plug the holes uh, that we've got from enrollment, uh, from our enrollment loss. We move the institution forward in some key areas. We get additional compensation into your hands to keep you here, to keep you motivated, to signal that you are the university. We are a human asset institution, and we need to do the very best we can do uh, for you. And uh, if you want to look at these in more details, here's the, here's the presentation uh, that you can review with uh, accompanying documents. Now let me just close on this note. Uh, why are we doing all of this? And is it worth it? Because there are some sacrifices here and there are some challenges. But I just have to remind us why we do this, and it is for our students. And I also want to say that the future looks very, very bright. Uh, this is the, what we're working through is a short-term issue. So if I can just revisit quickly uh, what we're facing here. Um, look at what happened this year in the legislative session. I want to go back to that. Um, we pitched a classroom building, a very large classroom building. 3,000 new classroom seats, 1,000 seat auditorium, 20 study rooms, uh, over 200 offices. At one point, in the legislative session, this is where we found ourselves on the priority list coming out of the recommending legislative uh, body, 14th. You can see we're down below a lot of very meaningful, needed projects around the state. You can also see, if you can read that, that we're also the biggest, at least of the first 14. I think it was part of the reason we, we, we were kind of pushed down. It was like, if we help them, we can't do these other things. And uh, I, don't, I don't bring this up to say, you know, look, aren't we great? We made, we made this happen. I do want to pay tribute to our team, Val Peterson, Cam Martin, Linda Macon, myself. We worked very hard on this to get our story out. But at the end of the day, it was the legislators that made the decision. And they decided to fund that building and only three or four other things from that list. And we're really the only building 
on the higher ed list. There was a bunch of higher ed requests there, and UVU got funded for that. It, it came in a year, and I got a little criticized for this. How, how can you go up to the hill and ask for a huge classroom building when you're going to be down all those students in the fall? It's because I know those students are coming back. That's the, that's the power of this, unlike other cuts. We, uh, other time when you get cuts, you don't know if the money's coming back. We're virtually certain these students are going to come back. They're probably going to be better prepared, a little more serious, a little more likely to retain. And so we have to build that building now so that we're ready when those, when those students come back. And so uh, we're very pleased that we got $54 million, all but $1 million of our request, and then we got the additional $1 million uh, for O&M. That, to me, is a signal that the legislature sees what I'm saying is true, that growth is still coming to UVU. And while we've got this little bit of downturn, we need to be prepared for what's ahead, which is more growth, more dynamism, more development uh, of our programs. Let's talk about the funding side for just a minute. Um, here's what we requested. We requested to be treated as employees on a COLA. That was the one thing we didn't get. Uh, other state employees got 1%. But look at what we did get on our equity and distinctive mission. We asked for $8 million in each category. We got nine. And one of the things we were effectively told was, well, you got a little more than you asked, so if you can use that with other things, then try to do your 1% uh, tuition. So I think there was sensitivity to that. More importantly, and most importantly of all, is to look at what happened on the um, distinctive mission and equity side. On the distinctive mission side, you can see that out of $9 million uh, shared across eight institutions, we got a pretty good share of that, uh, of $1 million. On the equity side, uh, we got, well, we got this. 29% of those equity monies went to UVU. Now, uh, I know probably to us it just seems, well, that's, that's only fair, but in a political public situation, you can, I hope you can imagine how difficult it is to sell that to your colleagues, to other legislators, that we ought to get that much more money than other people. And yet we did it. And so, again, I take that not to toot our own horn so much as to say that look at the trend. We got a little bit of equity money last year, a million dollars. We got over $2 million this year. And coming out of the session, not only did we get this, but we started to get commitments from people to say, we know you're not finished. We know we need to do more on equity. So even as we face the, down, the, the downturn in the fall, I'm optimistic, I'm hopeful that we will go and be successful again in arguing that there's still room to be, uh, still progress that needs to be made on the equity front and that we will do effectively what we did again, which has been a pretty historic thing, which is get a lot of new money from the legislature even as we've had fewer students. And so on that sense, I think uh, the future looks very bright. And then, and then finally, uh, our trend lines. We know we're in a dip. Uh, we can't change that. Uh, but again, we think the dip will be short-lived. And maybe our end point now looks more like 43,000 than 46,000. But we're still headed to over 40,000 students for this institution. All of the long-term factors are still in play. The demographics of this community, the, the, the dynamism of this community, the politics of this community suggest that we will be here, that we will be uh, the, I think, significant institution of higher education in this state by virtue of what we will be doing for the largest proportion of Utah students in the state. And what is amazing to me most of all is that through all of this, we just continue to move undaunted and generate the kinds of students that we're doing. I want to show you something now. As part of uh, our campaign to reach out to students and, and to uh, recruit them, we're doing some things we haven't done before. We're doing some TV commercials. And these are a few spots. They're quick, so bear with me. I know we're kind of running at the end of the hour here. but. Uh, we made these ourselves. Uh, we didn't go off to some slick uh, California ad agency. But uh, take a look at what this says about our students, about our institution. I had an idea. Lots of people have ideas. But engaged learning helped me develop my idea and make it real. 
and now with sales over a million dollars? Best assignment ever. I hate math. I can't count how many times I've heard people say that. And as a math teacher, I take it personally. So, while working on my master's at UVU, I developed ways to help kids not hate math. Does engaged learning make a difference? You do the math. I don't think of myself as just an undergrad. Okay, so I'm a sophomore, but I'm at UVU where it's all about engaged learning. Leading a project on DNA research, I don't have to wait for grad school to get this kind of experience. As a UVU student, I guess you could say engaged learning is in my DNA. People talk about life after college, you know, entering the real world. But this is engaged learning. I'm not just reading about it or watching someone else do it. I'm learning by doing. I'm at UVU. I'm in the real world every day. They say the devil is in the details. And in here, there are a lot of details. Flavor, color, texture, temperature, presentation. It all has to be flawless. Pressure? Maybe. But with engaged learning, I get a lot of practice. And I'll bet your homework never tasted this good. We did those ourselves. Uh, we didn't go hire some slick ad agency from California, and we didn't hire actors. Those are our students. Those are your students. And they are our greatest success. And they're why we do what we do. And it's why we keep slugging it out and finding ways to make this institution work and work in a gloriously successful way. The other thing I love about those ads is that it's all right there. Engaged on the face of it. It's our engaged learning campaign. Inclusive, the range of students, the men, the women, the races, the colors, the religions, the seriousness, undergraduate research, excellence in all that we do across the disciplines, all leading those students to great student success. And it's, it's wonderful. I, 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 keep, I just thrill every time I see those. But even more thrilling is the individual interaction you get. I've just been saying the last couple of days that there's, there's hardly a day that doesn't go by that I'm not inspired, individually inspired, by an individual student and their story. I told, uh, I've already told a couple of times an event that happened on Friday. Uh, in, the, in the cabinet, we're trying to, again, lead by example with our commitment to students. We have a presidential internship program. We each hire an intern to work with us through the year. We give them real assignments. They go to our most important meetings. They help us on a week-to-week -week basis. And we had this woman come in to interview. Janeth was her name. And uh, she talked uh, with great eloquence and poise and did a, a wonderful job. And in the course of that, we discovered uh, she was part of uh, our inaugural class of uh, Latino educators uh, who came in on this outreach program from a background that told her she couldn't go to college and she couldn't succeed. And not only did she come in through that program, but there she was four years later as a senior saying, I'm a 3.19, a 3.91 GPA in elementary education. What a success, what a transformation. And the even more moving thing was afterwards with tears in her eyes, uh, communicating to say, you know, if I don't get this internship, it's okay. Today was the proudest day of my life. And that's just one little moment that I'm having. And I know you folks are having these moments all the time, or you're at least making them possible all the time. I had an experience this morning, just before I came to this meeting. I was meeting with a student in my office, a student who told me he'd been raised in an abusive situation at home. And through a mentor and a friend was shown that he could go to college, 
comes to UVU, finds his way uh, into the peace and justice studies, is inspired by Dr. Minch and others, and a whole new world is opened up to him. And now he's graduating and off to law school where he wants to be a guardian ad litem to protect children into the future. That's what we're doing here. And we're finding a way to do it. And we'll get through these uh, tough times and the future is brighter and we'll do what we've done for these 30,000 and we'll do it for even more as we work together. It's an honor, it's a fantastic honor to work with you in this initiative. I take my hat off to you and wish us all the very best in the coming year. Thank you very much.